there is something romantic about the boisterous nightlife in the saloons, gambling houses, and dance halls. Something fascinating about drunken brawls over cards and painted women. And something thrilling about famous gunfighters snuffing the life out of equal famous gunfighters with six shooters. FB Street. Towards the end of the 19th century, as railroads began to stretch toward the western frontier, a new type of town began to emerge. These were primarily cow towns, characterized by lawlessness and violence, but they eventually evolved into more peaceful centers of agricultural communities. The Kansas cow town was established out of necessity to meet the settlers' needs and provide a means of commerce. The cattle industry played a significant role in the growth of these towns, serving as the population's primary income source for almost two decades. A cow town was often depicted as a rowdy place where gunshots could be heard, windows were smashed and saloons were filled with cowboys drinking cheap liquor and talking to prostitutes about longhorn cattle and the thrill of fighting. Despite being seen as wild and rough, a cow town was economically steady. However, if the town became too quiet at night, it was a sign of trouble and could lead to economic issues. Wild West Podcast proudly presents Cow Towns, Part 1 Abilene and its Famous Lawmen. During the early days of Cow Towns, they were primarily inhabited by adventurous frontier men looking to make a quick profit. When cattle driving and shipping season began, a large number of nomadic cowboys, prostitutes, and gamblers would flock to these towns. As the prosperity brought by the cattle trade began to boost the economy of these towns, grangers, merchants, artisans, laborers, and their families started to settle there. This gradually led to the single frontier men moving further westward. As the railroads expanded westward, Ellsworth, Hayes City, Newton, Wichita, Dodge City, and further towns south and west became cattle shipping points. During this time, some five to six million cows parted through the multifarious shipping junctures on their way to the market. Of the many towns that grew up around this thriving industry, only four or five ever received national claim as wild and woolly cow towns. The cowboy at the terminus of the Northern Drive was a distinguishable kind. His convention on the range made an uncompromising injunction on his endurance capabilities. It signified that he might have to consume the more consequential facet of a year without the conveniences of a bed to rest from his grind or a roof over his head for preservation from the elements. Much of his duration was dispersed in the saddle, sometimes two or three days at a time. Moreover, the cattlemen were paid $25 to $40 for the trek, which provided them with plenty of money to spend on entertainment at the end of their journey. One commentator said, When these boys reached the terminus of their drives, this little settlement was a metropolis to them and they sought to enjoy themselves as best they could with such means as were available. After expending 30 to 60 days on the trail in dust, heat, storms, and elevated water existing on coarse meals, he was ready for and deserved a slight leisure. When the herd was loaded or sold and he had drawn his pay, he was prepared to open up. He typically started by fixing an untried outfit from the fancy, quilted top, tight-fitting dress boots with the pronounced lone star in the tops to the new Stetson 10-gallon hat. This new hat alone sometimes commands as much as $75. The trail-ridden individual extracted the grime of the trail, visited a barber shop, and then donned his new accoutrements, ready to begin his respite and repose period. The establishments on Texas Street 
catered to his most destructive intensities. The saloons, gambling houses, dance halls, and houses of ill fame blossomed and flourished on his sort. He might become hilariously intemperate, often becoming engaged in an altercation over money, a girl, or some matter deferred on the journey up the Chisholm Trail, and it all too often culminated in gunplay. In these circumstances, the Texas cowboy was a precarious character to encounter. J.B. Edwards, a pioneer who lived in Abilene during the cattle trade, says, When the Texan connected with the cattle trade and got to Tanglefoot abroad, he was highly liable, under the least provocation, to use his Navy's six shooters. If their fancy told him to shoot, they did so in the air or at anything they saw, and a plug hat would bring a volley from them at any time, drunk or sober. The cowboy's babyless circumstances made him an easy mark for the purveyors of sin. His complete essence was reached within a week of many instances, and he was ready to yield to his vocation on the plains. Sometimes the cowboy hawked his ponies or got an advance from his employer. He then used the money to travel back to Texas by rail and water, and sometimes he rode his pony back down the trail with the chuck wagon and the cook. Nevertheless, their appetites were met quickly. Abilene, a sleepy village of a dozen log cabins roofed with dirt and a few business buildings, became a raucous cow town in a few weeks. Soon it had 11 saloons with gambling houses in the back, several dance halls, and a whole colony of sporting women. It was in 1866 when the sleepy town of Abilene perked up from its slumber to begin its catering service in the form of many entertainment establishments along its thoroughfares. One of the first well-known establishments was the Alamo Saloon. The Alamo was the most intricate of the saloons, and its characterization will give an idea of the builder's motive for grandeur. It was harbored in a long room with a 40-foot orientation on Cedar Street facing the west. There was an access at either end. At the west entrance, there were three double glass doors. Inside and along the front of the south side was the bar with carefully polished brass fixtures and rails. From the back bar arose an immense mirror, which imaged the lustrously plugged liquor bottles. At diverse places over the walls were notable paintings in cheaply done replicas of the nude masterpieces of the Venetian Renaissance painters. The entire floor space shrouded gaming tables where virtually any game of chance could be yielded. The Alamo boasted an orchestra that played mornings, afternoons, and late into the twilight. Abilene, the foremost of Kansas Railroad cow towns, was characteristics of these frontier communities in its beginning, civic development, and transition. It began as a station on the Overland stage lines. It acquired its pinnacle as one of a succession of northern railroad terminals and shipping points on the Texas cattle trails, over which millions of longhorn cattle were driven in search of a market between 1866 and 1889. At the season's pinnacle, the saloons were the scene of constant activity. At night, their clangors were an assortment of poorly yielded popular music, granulated voices, coarse laughter, and Texan whoops, punctuated at times by gunshots. As Joseph McCoy put it, The cattle trade was accompanied by the ballroom, the theater, the gambling room, the body house, the dance house. Of course, he added, Every possible device for obtaining money in both an honest and dishonest manner was abundant. But not all of the coexisting economic expansion was necessarily welcome. Abilene inhabitants seemed shaken when they realized what it meant to be the town at the end of the trail. The cattle trails were approximately 300 miles long, and the trip took 30 to 40 days. The days were long and tiring for the men who tooled the trail but they were ready to celebrate when they reached a market town in Kansas. They had been in the saddle for weeks with a monotonous diet, no women, and no entertainment beyond the nightly howling of the coyotes. In cow towns like Abilene, 
the saloon keepers and gamblers shared some of the same characteristics. They worked together to profit from free-spending Texans. Saloon keepers were tough, always ready for trouble, and partnered with gamblers to extract hard earnings from the free-spending Texans. Saloon keepers set the stage while gamblers reaped the bounties. Saloon keepers were usually rugged fellows, ready at all times to meet the emergency created by a rough house. The gambler usually wore costly apparel and flashy jewelry. While at work, he maintained the expressionless poker face and sauntered indifferently from place to place while at leisure. While the games of chance were believed to be relatively free from fleecing, the professional gamblers used the maneuvers of their trade on the liquor-befuddled Texans. When this was detected, gunplay was usually the result. During the early years of the cattle trade in Abilene, prostitutes from various cities caused significant issues and were a result of social unrest. These female harpies drifted in from places like Kansas City, St. Louis, and Memphis, which were the debris from a disturbed social tide following the Civil War. Initially, they resided near the business section before being pushed to the brothel district and eventually a supervised section southeast of town. At one point, some of these notorious prostitute sites were located next to Texas Street, just across from the schoolhouse. The houses of prostitution were later relocated to a section adjoining the town site on the southeast, which became a part of the town under Fisher's addition. Here, the colony was under police oversight, and an attempt was made to prevent the violent disturbances that had occurred when the underworld exceeded the law's scope. The presence of these prostitutes in Abilene was well documented in city council minutes and ordinances, showing the challenges they posted to public opinion and law enforcement efforts. Texas Street in Abilene was the central business extremity of the cattle trade days. The street extended west from Cedar Street to the Mud Creek Ford, and both sides became sheathed with saloons, gambling houses, and dance halls. It was on Texas Street that, somewhat undetermined intervals, there were arrived and vacated characters like Wes Harden, Ben and Billy Thompson, Phil Coe, and the Clements boys, portrayed as outlaws, cutthroats, desperados, gunmen, and like representations. These eclectic characters frequented Texas Street sporadically at uncertain intervals. They took part in the lawless life of Texas Street and moved on when the fancy struck them, or the circumstances deemed it advisable. They committed lawless actions before pushing on at will. In addition, wealthy individuals, curiosity seekers, Wall Street brokers and journalists from Eastern Dailies also visited Texas Street, seeking excitement and first-hand experiences of the Wild West. Maintaining law and order in Abilene during the cattle trade era was not a priority for county officers who needed more effort to address the issue. There were regularly elected county officers, but they made no serious effort to curb the era's lawlessness. They eventually gave up responsibility for handling lawlessness outside their jurisdiction. Before its incorporation in 1869, Abilene had a personal approach to resolving disputes, with little involvement of third parties. It was not uncommon for disputants to engage in gunfights in secluded locations to settle their issues. While friends of the participants would witness these contentions, Minimal interference was tolerated as long as rules were followed. However, this approach was risky and often led to fatal consequences. Stuart Henry says, When you heard one or two shots, you waited breathlessly for a third. A third shot meant a death on Texas Street. In 1869, the citizens of Abilene, Kansas, recognized the need for municipal organizations to bring order to the chaos in their community. They presented a petition to probate Judge Cyrus Kilgore, which was granted, resulting in the incorporation of Abilene as a city of the third class. 
The court appointed trustees as temporary mayor and council, and some ordinances were passed. However, little was done to address the city's lawless element due to the cattle trade decline in 1869. The trustees continued to carry out the functions of government until May 1871. In 1870, a new board of trustees was appointed. T.C. Henry was elected as the chairman, and W. Francher, a schoolteacher, was the secretary. They enforced laws against saloons, houses of ill fame, and other crimes in the city. A total of 32 saloons were licensed, with closing hours specified. The houses of ill fame within the city limits were outlawed, and an attempt was made to recognize and enforce laws against the more flagrant crimes to maintain some decency in the city. City offices, marshals, and ordinances were established to bring order and decency to the city. The ordinance that sparked the most debate and commotion was the one that prohibited carrying firearms within the city limits. This announcement was displayed on large bulletin boards at all major roads entering the town. Initially, people viewed these signs with admiration and interest, and it took some time before they fully grasped their significance. The problem of preserving law and order in Abilene in the early days of the cattle trade was not because they were not trying, but because more effort was needed to cope with the situation. The elected county officers made no earnest effort to restrain the lawlessness. After failure, they waived the responsibility regarding the infraction of law outside their jurisdiction. Historian Wayne Lee pointed out that Abilene, Texas, had no law enforcement, which was not a problem as long as the Cowboys stayed within the rowdy district. However, when they started invading Abilene, Kansas, with their loud hollering, whooping, and shooting, the city authorities decided to hire a marshal. Theodore C. Henry, Abilene's inaugural mayor, was a man of desperate majors. As the cowboys, who steered the vast herds of Texas cattle into the town's stockyards, reveled in the local saloons and body houses upon receiving their pay, Henry needed law enforcement officers to rein in these rugged cowhands. He embarked on a mission to broadcast the town's urgent requirement for suitable candidates. Tom Smith, known as Bear River, was a man of paradoxes. Quiet, unassuming, and soft-spoken, he was the least likely person to be associated with law enforcement. Yet this auburn-haired man of average height and weight, sporting a thick mustache and piercing blue-gray eyes, was a force to be reckoned with when the situation demanded. Originally from New York City, he had ventured westward a few years earlier, serving as a law officer in Kit Carson, Colorado, and Wyoming. In the Wyoming railroad town of Bear River City, he earned his colorful nickname, Bear River Tom. The nickname was earned after he single-handedly stood off both groups of railroad workers and townspeople during a violent conflict that erupted due to a railroad worker killing one of the townspeople, which resulted in vigilantes lynching the railroad worker. This, in turn, resulted in his fellow Gandhi dancers declaring war on the vigilantes. Troops from Fort Bridger eventually arrived and restored order. But before they did, Tom Smith prevented many deaths with his brave and daring intervention. It was also discovered that he had previously served as a member of the New York City Police Force and as marshal of several Union Pacific terminal towns. However, when Tom applied for the Abilene Marshal position... Mayor T.C. Henry thought the 175-pound, 5'11 young man was not up to the job. Several local men were also considered for the job, but they were found to be less qualified. Meanwhile, the situation on the streets of Abilene, a once peaceful town, was rapidly deteriorating. Cowboys were openly defying the law and taunting the police officers. They showed no regard for the city ordinances, even going as far as shooting holes in the signs that displayed them. This blatant disregard for the law pushed the city into a state of lawlessness, with the ordinance signs becoming unreadable and exacerbating the situation. Construction had begun on a city jail, but a group of cowboys destroyed it. The jail had to be rebuilt with round-the-clock guards. 
The first person incarcerated was a cook from a cattle camp near Abilene. A group of cowboys arrived in town, drove the guards away, busted the door lock, and released the prisoner. They insisted that stores close and even rode into some stores to give their orders. Eventually, they started shooting up the town. A posse of citizens was gathered to pursue the cowboys, and they captured and jailed a few of them. However, the cowboys continued to disregard the ordinance and mistreat law-abiding citizens. Two men recommended by the police chief in St. Louis arrived to assess the situation, but they quickly determined that the job was too complicated and returned to St. Louis on the next train. At the beginning of June 1870, the city council reconsidered Tom Smith's application to become a marshal, and he was hired as the only member of the Abilene police force. His beginning salary was $150 monthly, and he was paid $2 for every person he arrested and convicted. Later, J. H. McDonald was chosen as his assistant. Tom's main priority as city marshal was enforcing the law prohibiting carrying guns. Smith had his first confrontation in Abilene with a cowboy outlaw named Big Hank. When Smith asked for his gun, the burly Hank Hawkins loudly and profanely declared that no damn Yankee marshal was taking his gun. Smith struck him with a powerful punch without hesitation, disarmed him, and ordered him to leave town. This fighting style was a complete novelty to the cowboys, who were accustomed to the quick draw technique, leaving them in shock and intrigue. They did not understand how to fight with their fists. Hank's treatment was the subject of extensive discussion in the cattle camps. By morning, the atmosphere was thick with tension, as one of the desperado leaders, what known as Wyoming Frank, had already challenged the new marshal and his gun law, heightening the sense of anticipation and uncertainty. The following day, Wyoming Frank came to town and met Smith on the street. Smith approached Frank and asked him to surrender his openly carried guns. Frank slowly backed away, hoping to gain an advantage, but he eventually found himself backed against the door of a saloon. They were surrounded by a crowd at this point. When Smith repeated his request for Frank to give up his guns, Frank responded rudely. As a result, Smith punched Frank twice in the jaw knocking him out. He took Frank's guns away and hit him on the head with them. Smith then instructed Frank to leave town and never come back. Frank obeyed Smith's orders immediately. After the incident, a saloon owner walked into the street and praised Smith for his bravery. He handed over his gun and said he would not need it as long as Smith was the town marshal. Other people followed suit, and from that day on, the marshal had an easier time enforcing the gun ordinance. Every town business had a sign stating, you must deposit your guns with the proprietor until you are ready to leave town. Newcomers soon learned that the sign was not a joke. The merchants, gamblers, saloon keepers, and town citizens were thankful for Smith's efficient work. His salary was increased to $225 monthly in August, effective from the previous month. A police court was established, and from then on, those convicted had the option of paying the assessed fine, serving time, or leaving the town permanently. It is a strange twist of fate that Tom Smith did not meet his end at the hands of Texans, but rather was killed by two Scottish homesteaders named Andrew McConnell and Mr. Miles. On November 2, 1870, Smith and his assistant McDonald went to McConnell's dugout on Chapman Creek to arrest him on charges related to the shooting of their neighbor, John Shea. However, McConnell refused to submit to arrest and shot Smith. Miles, who was present with McConnell, then proceeded almost to decapitate Smith with an axe. McConnell and Miles fled the scene when McDonald returned with a posse, but they were later apprehended and sentenced to 12 and 16 years respectively in the penitentiary. The two captors, Judge C.C. C. Cooney and James Gainsford, 
were each awarded $100 reward by the city trustees. After Smith's death, Abilene needed a new lawman, and the famous Indian scout of the plains, James Butler Wild Bill Hickok, was recommended by Mayor Joseph McCoy. Hickok, renowned for his prowess as the best gunman in the West, was unanimously chosen as the new marshal on April 15, 1871. He was paid a salary of $150 a month, plus 25% of all fines and arrests made by him. Hickok, a man standing six feet tall and weighing about 175 pounds, was physically well-built, graceful in movement, and always alert and cool under fire. His striking features, including his brown, wavy hair, piercing gray-blue eyes, aquiline nose, and flowing mustache, made him a figure to attract attention. He dressed expensively and showily. Another physical description of Bill Hickok comes from Libby Custer, wife of George Armstrong Custer. Physically, he was a delight to look upon. Tall, lithe, and free in every motion, he rode and walked as if every muscle was perfection, and the careless swing of his body as he moved seemed perfectly in keeping with the man, the country, the time in which he lived. I do not recall anything finer in the way of physical perfection than Wild Bill when he swung himself lightly from his saddle, and with graceful, swaying step, squarely set shoulders, and well-poised head. He was rather fantastically clad, of course, but all that seemed perfectly in keeping with the time and place. He did not make an armory of his waist, but carried two pistols. In the summer of 1871, Abilene was flooded with a large group of unruly people. To assist Hickok, several special officers were appointed, including James Gainsford, who was one of the captors of Tom Smith murderers, James McDonald, who had accompanied Smith on his fatal mission to the cabin, Thomas Carson, who was Kit Carson's nephew, Brocky Jack Norton, who later served as peace officer in Ellsworth and Newton, along with Mike Williams. The following story, Wild Bill Meets Harden, is based on a rewritten article from the History Channel entitled, Old West Outlaw John Wesley Harden Arrives in Abilene. In 1871, at 18, a Texas rancher employed a young man named Hardin as the trail boss for a cattle drive along the Chisholm Trail to Abilene. Hardin was eager to escape Texas, as he had recently slain a Texas State Police guard who was transferring him to Waco for trial. He needed to lay low, but his temper got the best of him during the cattle drive. When a Mexican herd crowded Hardin's animals from behind, he complained to the Mexican in command of the other herd. As the exchange got heated, Hardin shot the Mexican through the heart. When Hardin and his cattle arrived at Abilene, Kansas in 1871, the town marshal, Wild Bill Hickok, exhibited no interest in prosecuting a murder case that had taken place outside his jurisdiction. Instead, he took a paternalistic interest in the young gunslinger. Even though Hardin was 16 years his junior, the two men formed an odd companionship. Like many of the early Western law enforcement officers, Wild Bill Hickok had earned a reputation for himself by perpetrating several killings of his own. Wild Bill may have seen something of himself in Hardin, believing he was a hot-tempered young man who would eventually become a helpful and law-abiding citizen. On his part, Hardin was simply proud to be associated with the renowned gunfighter. Hickok and Hardin spent several weeks together, drinking and engaging in womanizing. However, the marshal's faith in his young friend's fundamental decency was eventually shuttered. Hardin rented a room at the American House Hotel in Abilene. One night, a stranger in the adjoining room started snoring loudly, which irritated Hardin. Consequently, he began to shoot through the wall to silence the snoring man. The first bullet missed its target and woke the man up. Unfortunately, the second bullet hit the man, 
and he died instantly without questioning a thing. Hardin realized that his goodwill with Hickok would not save his life. He later said, I believed that if Wild Bill found me in a defenseless condition, he would take no explanation but would kill me to add to his reputation. Wearing only his undershirt, Hardin escaped through the hotel window by jumping to the street below. He spent the night hiding in a haystack, and then at dawn, he stole a horse and returned to the cow camp. He left for Texas the next day, never to set foot in Abilene again. During the summer of 1871, Hickok faced much criticism for handling law enforcement issues. Some citizens thought he spent too much time at the Alamo Saloon and delegated too much work to his assistants. Others disliked his habit of immediately restoring firearms to establish his authority. Those who respected Tom Smith, who took no part in the immoral practices of the Texans, were particularly vocal in their disapproval of Hickok's methods of carrying his guns and demonstrated a quick willingness to use them. Although many admired his physical courage, they quickly condemned him for exhibiting the same moral weaknesses as the Texans, though not to the same extent. In the book, Life and Marvelous Adventures of Wild Bill, author J.W. Buell recounts a gripping incident two days after Wild Bill started his job. A notorious gambler named Phil Coe and his unidentified associate decided to take over the town by causing chaos. They began by breaking windows, harassing women, firing their guns, and other similar acts. When Wild Bill, a beacon of law and order, encountered them, he immediately attempted to arrest them despite knowing Phil Coe's reputation. However, Coe drew his pistol and declared that the arrest would depend on the better man. The tension was palpable as Wild Bill's deputy, McWilliams, tried to calm Coe down and disarm him, unsure of how the situation would unfold. Coe was anxious for a fight and fired at Bill, but he missed his mark. Bill returned the fire, but at the moment he pulled the trigger of his pistol, Coe and his struggle threw McWilliams in front of him, and the bullet from the gun struck the faithful deputy, killing him almost instantly. Coe's pal, who until this time seemed a mute spectator of the affray, then drew his pistol and also fired at Bill, the bullet passing through Bill's hat. And before Coe or his mate could fire again, Bill had put a bullet through the head of each, and the fight was ended. Everyone most sincerely lamented the death of McWilliams, but by none as it was by Bill. And years afterward, he could not have the sad event recalled to mind without crying like a child. The events described, though not entirely accurate to the truth, perhaps served to soothe Hickok's soul, in that by blaming Coe for the death of Deputy Williams, his responsibility in the act was absolved. The killing of Coe was a most fortunate event for the better class of citizens of Abilene, because it once improved the morals of the place. The men who had for years before rioted at their pleasure, defied the law and badgered decency, began to feel that to continue in the same course would be to risk their lives. Nevertheless, the death of Phil Coe only diminished the lawless excess. It did not entirely prevent them. Bill never had another occasion to kill anyone in Abilene, but his club fell heavily on many heads determined on vicious acts. His enemies among the Texas cattlemen multiplied rapidly, and he realized that there was not a moment that he could safely turn his back on any of them. Bill arrested a noted cattle baron for violent conduct on the streets during a ruckus, and as the Texas cattle baron strenuously resisted, Bill was forced to use his club. The man paid his fine the following day, but before leaving town, he declared that he wouldn't get even with Bill before many months elapsed. There was a lot of tension surrounding an incident involving the Texas cowboys and the citizens of Abilene. Meanwhile, plans to develop the land north of the railroad away from the lawlessness in the southern part of the town, were already underway. 
The opposition to the cattle trade continued to grow stronger. The cattle season of 1871 was coming to an end, but the sentiments of the citizens of Abilene remained tense. This excerpt is taken from the Kansas Historical Quarterly, Abilene, first of the Kansas Cowtowns, by George L. Cushman. The prostitutes from the colony north of town had migrated to Texas Street and vicinity. There were ordinances prohibiting their practices within the city limits, but they were ignored. Petitions signed by women and the responsible people of the city were presented to the council asking for the enforcement of the ordinances, but the council was slow to give an ear. In the latter part of June, a restricted zone was established on the land adjoining the town site and owned by George Fisher. Here, the body houses might be located where shooting and stabbing and all-night life could be indulged in full blast. During the summer of 1871, an undercurrent of hard feelings had developed between Marshall Hickok and some Texans, encouraged by Phil Coe and Ben Thompson, proprietors of the Bull's Head Saloon. The feud came to a crisis on the evening of October 5th. The end of the cattle season was nearing and some Texans were celebrating their departure with a farewell spree on the streets of the city. They began their party on Texas Street about sundown. They carried Jake Karatowski to the Applejack Saloon, where he was made to stay in treats. This they did to other citizens they happened to find on the streets. They found Wild Bill in a boarding house eating his supper. He would have no part in their pranks, but he sent them to the bar of the Novelty Theater, where there they could get drinks at his expense. About 9 o'clock, while Hickok and his deputy Mike Williams were in front of the Novelty Theater, a shot was heard around the corner on Cedar Street. Bill hurried through the east door of the Alamo Saloon and went quickly to the front, asking in a rough manner who had fired the shot. Phil Coe, at the front with pistol in hand, replied that he had shot at a dog. Without further questioning, Hickok drew two revolvers and the two exchanged shots. Coe was mortally wounded while Hickok was not hit. Mike Williams, hearing the shooting, hurried around to the front of the saloon to aid the marshal. Bill, without recognizing Williams, shot him twice, and he died almost instantly. Cole lingered for several days and died in great agony. So ended the career of Wild Bill Hickok as Abilene's marshal. He was relieved of his duties less than two months after the accidental shooting. The death of Deputy Williams was an event that haunted Hickok for the remainder of his life. The incident was the last time Hickok was ever involved in a gunfight. If you are interested in more cattle trail history, the Western Cattle Trail Association is delighted to announce that it will be hosting an exclusive 150th anniversary conference in Dodge City, Kansas on November 1st and 2nd. This two-day gathering, reserved for those truly passionate about the history of the Western Trail, is not just a celebration, but also a unique platform to delve into the history of the Western Trail, provide free historical trolley rides of Dodge City, and a roundtable to discuss the formation of a cattle trails consortium. The upcoming conference provides a rare chance to learn about the historic trails that played a significant role in shaping America. These trails include the Western, Goodnight Loving, Chisholm, and Shawnee Trails. The conference will take place on Friday and Saturday, followed by the prestigious Kansas Cowboy Hall of Fame induction ceremony. On the evening of November 2nd, Michael Martin Murphy will give a captivating solo performance at the Dodge City Convention Center. Tickets will be sold separately for the Cowboy Hall of Fame induction ceremony and concert. Remember to mark your calendars for this momentous event in 2024 the 150th Anniversary Conference of the Western Cattle Trail, which will be held November 1st and 2nd in Dodge City, Kansas. We eagerly anticipate your presence as we commemorate 150 years of the Western Cattle Trail in Dodge City, Kansas. That's it for now. Remember to check out our Wild West podcast shows on iTunes or wildwestpodcast.buzzsprout.com. 
can also catch us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Wild West Podcast or on our YouTube channel at Wild West Podcast, Mike King YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to our shows listed at the end of the description text of this podcast to receive notifications on all new episodes. Thanks for listening to our podcast. And make sure you check out the Western Cattle Trail Association website at westerncattletrailassociation.com. If you have any comments or want to add to our series, please write us at wildwestpodcast at gmail.com. We will share your thoughts as they apply to future episodes. Join us next time as we travel back to 1867 and tell the story of the first of General Hancock's burning of the villages of Pawnee Fork and Custer's futile chase across the Kansas Plains. <laughs>